Yeah, so I've worked for a charity called the Community Extension Cluster, we call I'm just going to give you a big wrap around to that. Now I'm going to run through some three or four different projects we've got going at the moment, all with different relative levels of community ownership. So from through full ownership through public share issue, down to private financing. And um, so hopefully spark off some ideas and things you can possibly replicate in the area, or stuff we can extend out of call. Um, now, one of the big advantages of the charity I work for is we actually support communities doing renewable energy projects. We also support households, we run an energy advice centre for Cornwall, we work with businesses, uh, we work with schools doing education. So that means we can be much more realistic in the projects we deliver to communities. So we don't just talk about energy saving, let's talk about rolling out insulation programmes that'll actually pay to put the measures in people's houses. And I'm not quite sure if there's equivalent agencies around Exmoor. Um, one of the things I can do is possibly follow-ups to these events is try and get similar relationships established with people in the local area. There's a lot of people out there that will help, you just got to find them quite often. Now the first project I'm going to mention is another local community challenge project. It sounds quite similar to what's been happening here actually. Um, very interesting just to hear everybody talking about the kilowatt hours they've had out their PV arrays this week. Um, exactly the same thing that's happened in Laddock. Um, and one thing that's a big advantage to these projects, yes it was 500 million, but it's had a really big impact on the communities. Everybody's engaged, everybody's interested and quite excited. So, Lanark is an example of what you can do if you manage to get about right half a million pounds. Now, as people are probably aware, that's fairly unlikely in the future. Um, but there's nothing to say you can't raise 500 million pounds in your local community. Now, with Lanark, we've used it for a whole range of technologies on different buildings. Um, it's got every technology except for hydro in there, heat pumps, biomass units, small ones in people's houses, big ones around village halls, solar thermal, PV, wind turbines. And the interesting part about it, all the money that is created from all those systems and on people's homes, or on the schools, or on the pubs, that all goes into a local community fund. So Laddock is generating £35,000 a year for the next 25 years that will be used to reinvest in other low carbon projects, um, or subsidising insulation programmes. We're doing allotment schemes, they're looking at walking buses for the school. So we do try and tie everything down to low carbon. Although I would suggest it's very easy to think about any types of developments in a community and attach it to low carbon. You want a new school, make it low carbon. You want a new bus, make it low carbon. It's relatively easy to do. Um, so I do feel quite strongly about always trying to retain that attachment. The money's come from putting low carbon activity in. Let's try and make sure it supports further activity in that side. <coughs> now it has a co-op and it also has a bank on. So it has two separate structures there. Um, I won't go into depth on that. Fortunately, we have someone in Cornwall who works for the local co-op development body. Again, I would imagine there's something similar in your local area and that can actually work through these structures with you. So there's a lot of stuff Simon was talking about. Get someone in, talk about what you're trying to achieve, and they will be able to guide you through some of these legal structures. Because even I'm aware after two or three years looking at the legal side of things, it is very complicated. And that's why there's specialists out there to help you. So you don't get bogged down in 12 different IPS structures or the fact that there's a million different ways of doing it. Decide what you want to do, work on the structure afterwards. <coughs> Probably my most significant action we've seen out of the Ladder project. When we first started to develop it a year and a half ago, everybody was happy to be involved as long as we didn't put turbines up. They didn't want wind turbines. Everyone was really sceptical. Um, probably been reading too much press, didn't have actual much experience with wind turbines themselves. Ladder had their AGM a few months ago. There's now 60 odd members of the co-op and they unanimously supported the development of two solar farms and two wind farms in their parish. The reason for that is because they've looked at PV panels. Yes, they can contribute. Um, yes, they are useful. But if you look at the total energy needs for your area, you're going to need a lot of solar panels. It's not the case you can just put them in the appropriate place where it looks nice. If we're seriously going to meet all our energy needs, you're going to have to concede on some scales or some technologies. One of the advantages you'll have in Exmoor that we don't have quite so much in Cornwall is the hydro opportunities. Hydro can be very profitable um, and really on par with wind once it's actually developed. That's a real massive achievement there. And actually, the, um, the head of the parish council is very, very anti wind. It's one of it's his farm that we're actually looking to put the wind farm on. <laughs> Being involved, this is all engagement and understanding and involvement. We're not telling people what to do, we're asking them to get engaged, understand it for themselves. And it's fine if you want 120 kilowatt turbines in your parish, great. If you prefer to have one big turbine, that's down to you. People can actually make those decisions themselves. 
I think it's great to hear what's been going on in the local area here. Moving on to a project that is much more about community ownership. Um, community Power Cornwall is an industrial public society and a cooperative. We've been running for a couple of years now um, in terms of the development. We've actually had a share offer open for the last four or five months now, it's so mainly across the summer. Now, so I think point this one there. Just give you a very simple idea how it works. Community Power Cornwall comes in and develops wind turbine projects at the moment. <coughs> we do look at other technologies, but a key thing for us, um, certainly in the early days, we need to generate revenue. We can't support any other communities, we can't develop any other projects unless we have revenue coming in. So the big focus for us at the beginning is to make sure we have a technology that does produce a decent level of revenue. PV would be great, but the returns would be half as much, and it wouldn't produce enough to move things on fast enough for us. So that's the reason we're focused on wind. <coughs> Turbines go up, that generates revenue that comes back into the society. 3% of the money goes into a local low carbon fund. Um, and I was just telling someone earlier about equality within the local community. People can invest in community power Cornwall. It's a minimum investment of £50, maximum £20,000. There's people in the local area that don't have £50. Well, you can join the local low carbon fund for a pound. And then you decide how all revenue from turbines is allocated amongst your local community. So there are ways to engage people in the development of low-carbon initiatives without them having to put their money in, or how they do a little bit. <laughs> now, we can take investment from individuals, from businesses, from statutory agencies, from anybody who's interested in investing in the project. Um, we have expected returns of 5 to 8% over 10 years. And again, that's because we have wind projects running here. But these are wind farms, and I'll talk a little bit about the scale of the turbines we're looking at in a minute. Um, but it is attractive. We've had long, ongoing debates about how much you need to offer people to get them to invest. Is it 5%? Is it 10%? Is it 12%? Now, one big advantage of working in the community, why don't you ask people who live here how much return you have to offer them to get them to invest? So simply, you can see, you have contacts with that community, find out what they want and what you need. Now, first share offer, the one you before, has got two turbines up in Gorin, which is down near Nevergissi on the south coast of Cornwall. It's a whole mix of finance, really. One, if you can raise everything through share offer, perfect. Um, I would suggest, through our experience, that's fairly difficult to do, especially when you're talking nearly £600,000. Um, and it is an early concept, it's a new business. We don't have anything for the bank to secure against, we don't have assets, we don't have any operations, so early days on these projects are quite difficult. Um, we ended up raising 80,000 through individual share offers, so that's nearly 100 members um, across Cornwall that have invested in the project. We had 60,000 through an individual, um, and that was pretty much one of these business angels, high net worth individuals, whatever you like to call them, um, that understood about renewables. People understand renewables are investment, it's not very hard to sell. You only need to look at the feed-in tariff and you can see these developments are profitable. For us it's about what you do with that profit and how you use it. Um, we don't want to pay it all back to individuals because then the community doesn't benefit. It's a real balance. Um, and again, decisions for you to make in your local communities. You said this was a coal. Yeah. One of the things that we mentioned previously is that the coal can serve as asset. Yeah. Is that I need to ask that question. <laughs> I probably won't give you exactly the right answer. My partner who develops this project, the other director, works with a co-op development body, Paul Martin, that you will know. I believe there are changes you can make into some of the rules. Um, so it's not exactly a fixed asset block, but if the company dissolves or anything, any profits have to go to a similar charitable organisation. Mm. Co-ops don't have assets. Mm -hmm. No, what do you call what I just explained there? <laughs> you can't do that. You could always change it, that's true. You always vote it right? it's, The thing to remember is that you have to work out what is the risk? So if you've got a community that really wants something to happen, what would drive someone to then ruin that place? So it's about risk, it's about how much you want to involve people. And it's all technical and it's, you have to make choices. <laughs> I, I don't think it's a good thing. You get one of these people in your group. Hundred members. Yeah. Well, why would the 100 members want to give up the turbine to start with? That would be an interesting point. They will make money over the term for it, they will money into the community, so why would we get rid of that? So, so if it's a bigger return, there's more sense in retaining it than moving it on. 
And one of the things with the one member, one vote, obviously you can't get a small group of people to put a lot of money in and suddenly want to sell the project off because everybody has the equal say on it. But there's positive negatives that everybody has to do for um, we also managed to secure a loan from the Low Carbon Society. Now, this is something clever you can potentially do with grants. If you take a public grant at the moment, it disqualifies you from the feeder tariff. If you take a public grant and put it into a revolving fund and make a loan, the body receiving the loan can have the feeder tariff. So you hear lots about revolving funds and things at the moment. Um, that is one of the reasons for it, I would suggest. That's certainly our reason. So where we Sorry, will you say that again? <laughs> so, <laughs> we take public grant money, we can't put that directly into the wind project because it disqualifies from the feeding tariff. So we put the public grant money into a revolving fund, the fund makes a loan to the wind turbine project. So that's a really public grant. Who runs the revolving fund? That is a separate body, um, there is also a IPS structure. That has a separate body. We have two boards. We have two separate structures, yeah. So there's only one for the other Yeah. Have you, have you run that by off-gen, that sort of money laundering? I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you ask off-gen that question, I would suggest you wouldn't get anywhere, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I've tried that question and they haven't got back to me yet. So yeah. I, was, well, I assumed that um, you I'll would. off-gen usually do. They refer me back to the Energy Saving Trust. That's where I work. So it's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite ridiculous, unfortunately. So. <laughs> this is the whole body of the I shouldn't go into it too much. It's hard to get hard to sell off German debt quite often, I would say. And certainly with the Low Carbon Communities Challenge, we all had this problem. We were qualified for the team to the tariff, then we didn't. Um, we didn't use a revolving fund there, we actually transferred ownership to the houses. Um, but it's all coming ways to get around the rules and keep moving. Um, we also, which was a great achievement, although extremely painful, I would say, um, secured a loan from the Ecology Building Society. Um, that's just come through in the last couple of weeks. It took eight months instead of eight weeks. Um, it's the first time they've loaned to community renewable projects of this type. One of the big difficulties we're having, um, <coughs> lots of banks are talking about loaning to community renewables, Triodos, lots of other ethical lenders. Um, essentially, they want it to be multi-million pound projects. Now, that so fits in, as I can see, with the processes they already have and the amount of due diligence they have to put forward. Now what seems to be missed at the moment, you're still going to have to raise 40-50% of that money yourself. So as you, soon as you start aggregating projects and turning to multi-millions, your sheriff has got to raise millions as well. Um, and I don't think the banks have quite realised you need all the money to actually progress the projects. Um, but it is very early days, I would say. And um, hopefully this will open up much more in the future. So the two turbines went up last week, we had our launch actually, last Saturday. And I've said another really good thing about this project, we have not had a single piece of negative media coverage on it from anybody. And most of the anti wind farm groups live in Cornwall and Devon. Um, I know most of them stay on the screen with me quite regularly. Um, because this was backed by the community, the community decided where they wanted to put it. They chose the scale of the turbine. Um, it's part of a much bigger scheme looking at big PV projects in the village as well. The anti groups won't turn up and shout at people because the people who live there decided they want to put it there. And it seems like a simple concept, and um, probably most of us understand it. But actually getting people involved where you're living is clearly the best approach, I would suggest. I'll just give you a little idea of the technology here. So it's interesting with the scale. Uh, we don't have national parks in Cornwall, but about 33% of the county's area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, so we have similar issues in terms of landscape and scale. And one big advantage we now have, the AOMB management plan now includes sustainable energy supply to towns and villages within the AOMB. Um, so if it comes to talking about national park policy or consultations go out, that would be a good way to drive things forward, I think. If US communities want sustainable energy supply and renewables, you have to tell the national parks, and that's how it gets into the politics themselves. But it's quite useful now because we can look at the town, well here's the energy demand, yep, we'll put some solar panels over there, that's going to contribute half a percent of the total energy need. Um, we had it looking at turbines. What we usually get is, yes, we support renewables, but that's not the appropriate place, and that's not the appropriate scale. <coughs> because we're looking across whole parishes, well, we'll go to the other side, and we'll go to the other side. So now people do actually have to make decisions. It's not the fact we have one site to look at. Um, Boy, I'm going to talk about in a minute. We've got 19 different sites there. Um, so the AMB and planners also have to think about it more specifically. We've agreed we need sustainable energy. 
Okay. So how do we actually get it? And realistically, how much does each different technology contribute? It's all voluntary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's not even going that one. But I've heard palm trees and going actually. <laughs> 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 I mean, this, this is an interesting scale. Now, this is about a quarter of the size of the modern wind turbines. So this is nowhere near wind farm scale. Is that the height to the top of the, to the top of the blade or to the tower? 25 metres is to the hub. Uh, to the hub. And then you need to add half the motor down to on top. Another way to the top. Yeah. So it's interesting, it's bigger than the proven turbines in one in the National Park here. Um, but as I mentioned, it's about a quarter the size of modern wind turbines. So it's really finding some people are happy with it in this way. And again, the community decided they wanted this turbine, I didn't impose it on them. They were happy with the size of it. Part of it was the look of it as much as anything. They wanted something that looked quite graceful and was a nice entrance to the village. Um, and obviously a big benefit here, our uh, payback just over four years. Um, so you don't have to go to huge scale turbines to actually get a very good return. What about ongoing maintenance? So it's quite high cost, isn't it, on these machines? No, thousand pounds a year. Thousand pounds a year. And the first, you get a five year maintenance contract with the turbines. There's different turbines do different things, and this is one we're using a lot at the moment. Um, very, very quiet. So again, lots of people's perceptions of wind, it's going to be noisy, it's going to destroy my life, I won't be able to live in my house. Well, at 160 metres, this is under 35 decibels, which means all the World Health Organisation guidelines. Has anybody thought of a turbine that when it wind's not blowing, it just goes like a telescope, goes down and out of sight? Not here, because the community actually see this as a token of what they're trying to achieve. So this is now positive in the like community. Mm. <laughs> 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 the point that doesn't exist. Can you And, and it is, and one thing with the National Park to remember, it's not that you have to stick it on the top of the highest hill, it's windy in lots of other areas, as I worked out last night. <coughs> it is possible to put it on a slightly lower length hill, so the turbine is actually, <coughs> it blends into the background, it's not standing prominent on the skyline. But you have to look at wind resources, and obviously the National Park, I assume, would be happy to discuss things like that with people. You can always paint it green. Yeah. <laughs> paint it green. Uh, that's been done actually on uh, the smaller wind turbines in the National Park. So they've been painted uh, olive talk, which uh, helps yeah. to blend in with the natural surroundings. Right. In Cornwall, we have to paint them all grey. So this is what's if for yourselves working in the National Park. Is, Part of that is a large part of planning policy you're going to have to follow. If they're happy to work with you on how you integrate technologies into the landscape, great, you've got a huge head start there. This isn't an ongoing battle, which is very nice to see. And it's probably been like that five, six years ago, certainly with wind turbines. We put the tail on the ground. Yeah, yeah, we do. We can run it overhead, but there's not a lot of point. It's only digging a trench a couple of metres deep. So. That estimated cost, is that for the, the proxy sort of cost, is that for, for the pair of them? Uh, no, each. That's each, is it? Yeah, and then there's 26,000 grid connection on top of that. Right. What, what? 26,000. Oh, wait, so that's for the two, two, two. No, that's each. Each? So it's 5,000 each, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the first side, we've got that 130,000 pounds a year coming through. And each one is 250,000. Yeah. Yeah. The bigger you go, the better the reason to turn to get, the smaller you can go, don't you choose. Um, at Goran, it's about 8 metres per second, actually, it's very high. Um, but you're going to find similar wind speeds around a lot of these areas. I mean, one of the things, the reason this is quite accepted in the village where we're working, the village faces the sea. So we haven't put the turbine in the village, we put it in the farmland behind it. And the reason we've been able to do that is because we've been looking at all the resources across the whole parish. So it's not just thinking, what can I do on my roof or in my garden? Mm -hmm. Let's look at the whole area we all live in as a community, mm -hmm. identify the best resources we have and the most appropriate scales, and develop things in that manner. And now, what's the advantage of? See, this is 20 to 25 percent return on this turbine. We can pay our shareholders 5 to 8 percent, which is enough to pull people in. And that obviously leaves us with a big gap to reinvest in developing more projects with other communities. Now it's hard to do that with solar at the moment, unfortunately. Um, unless your shareholders are happy to take a 3% return. We're getting off awesome. them by now. Do you have any sites where you're com around the coast where you're combining a marine turbine with a wind turbine? Because we're about to get 250 turbines out here in the Severn.
Yeah. Uh, and at the moment, I understand they're not looking at marine turbines. They're going to take a, a terrific amount of concrete to install sensibly. We've got uh, the second highest tidal variation in the world. And the yeah. tide happens every day, whether the wind's blowing or not. It seems to be a no-brainer yeah. to put those in. Do you have any it experience does, but with then that? I would probably argue the barrage was the best option. If you well, OK, but the, the barrage has been energy. talked about for 100 years. I mean, <laughs> these are being installed. Um, yeah, well, I, and I think it's perceptions of what people think are acceptable. Do you have any experience of that there, off Cornwall? No, it's too yeah. deep, mainly off Cornwall. Right, OK. Um, we won't have any offshore turbines for a long okay. time um, until they put them everywhere else, so it's a bit shallow. Mm -hmm. what, I don't, what I don't understand with that is, how does the actual community benefit from that? Um, yeah. far as I, can, I mean, you, you're mentioning the shareholders benefiting, but how does people that are not investing in it, is there any benefit to the community in that way? Yeah, yeah, in, in different ways really. We, we work with local groups in the area, so it's actually the community that decides where everything goes, so there's a lot of engagement early on. Mm -hmm. um, we also roll out insulation programmes with all these schemes, so when we look at the energy needs initially, we get a target figure for the total energy they need, we then target each insulation programmes to reduce the demand before we try and match it with renewables. <coughs> So they're already getting involved in that sort of broader low carbon agenda. We also only had the share offer open a month earlier in the local community. So for the food parishes where the turbines are, everybody there had the first opportunity to invest before we opened it out any further to Cornwall. And the other major benefit, sorry, so then if you invest directly yourself, you get the direct financial benefit back yeah. as a member. Um, but we also put the 3% into the local community fund. I see. So there's opportunities as individuals, as members, but equally we put money into yeah. that community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to support other low carbon projects. Interestingly, my, my cost for a turbine of this scale is about £3,000. That's not including my time. So this is not a phenomenal amount of money to actually get up and running. So the 3% going into the local community is about £4,500 a year. It doesn't sound like a huge amount. Um, actually, you can get quite a long way with that. Um, certainly, if you're looking at smaller measures with smart metering or let's get everyone low energy light bulbs, there's a huge amount of stuff you can do that doesn't cost tens of thousands. Um, one thing you will find once you get a project through planning and get it permitted, the financing options open up. Obviously, what we're trying to do is encourage as much of that benefit to stay in the local economy. But at the end of the day, you can go to the bank ideally soon, or plenty of people from the city will throw money at you for these turbines. Because the returns are high. I have some share off documents in the back. I'll have a look at. I've just got one. Sorry. Should have said the second question. <laughs> On the, the other scale, Community Power Cornwall is about the whole of Cornwall and opening up to the community there to invest. Now, one thing we don't know at the moment is it better to actually have a much more localised share offer? So, we have a launch in Foy on Saturday. And they've got 18 sites, they've identified a whole mix of technologies. They're going to set up a co-op and they're going to run a share offer just in their local parish. And it's going to be very interesting whether that actually raises more investment because it's people in Foy doing a share offer with people in Foy, as opposed to Community Power Cornwall doing it in a local village. So we're also going to have that model up and running. Um, and there's a lot of money in Foy, but very similar structures and models. One thing I would say, and it's quite different to what other people are doing with share offers, the massive advantage for us is that we get it through planning permission. Without that, it's very hard to get any investment at all. Um, we also don't just restrict it to the local area, because at the end of the day, if you can't raise the money, nothing will happen. So it's a lot for us about giving local people the opportunity. If they don't want to take it up, then we're pulling it out to other communities. So it's not restricted in that way. Oh, sorry, finally. <laughs> just on the other end of the scale, um, private finance, rental roof schemes, lots of people love them or hate them. Um, essentially, we've got about £900 million pounds, um, that's available now to put PV onto community buildings, businesses, schools, farms, community hospitals, all across Cornwall, and we're spreading it out to Devon um, and potentially could have this available in Exmoor as well. Now, yes, someone is renting your roof, but unless you're going to use that roof, what value is there in it? It sits there, it doesn't do a lot. Is there issues yeah. about selling the building to someone else? Mm -hmm. um, no, the Association of Mortgage Lenders just released information that they would have no issue with it. Um, it does need to go to the land registry as well. You need to basically inform the mortgage lender. One thing I suppose we don't know at the moment is how it affects house prices, but we can look at every other country that's done a big entire amount of house prices. Once you've um, rented your room to someone, you're selling property. Yeah. 
who who is then who are they rent, then renting their rooms in? The original people sign the contract. Now it gets passed on to the next owner. Okay. Essentially, you've got to you're selling a house. Now some people say, oh, no one buy it because it's got PV or A on, or lots of people buy it because it's got free electricity supply. Look at the entire the original owner money. Do you still get the keeping card? Is that the other one? You can basically allocate the feed in to a third party, so you can allocate it to yourself or allocate it to someone else. So you can put installation on roof and make sure the feed in tariff money goes elsewhere. Can you change that designation over the length of year? You can, I believe, yes. Although, obviously, this is, of course, people haven't done that yet. Um, the feed in tariff doesn't do that at all. But you can change it, you set it to, you can change it where it goes. So it should be relatively simple to do. Um, and can you is giving away your resource, or you can see it as a massive opportunity to roll out huge amounts of renewables and make massive carbon savings. And the communities do benefit, you do get the energy use and you get retention of the export as well. So it is a million miles away from how the world program is still. Just briefly, to, where to start? So I've read a lot of things at you. Think about your community, think about the area. Is it a parish, is it a village? Define it, work out what your energy demand is, target the energy reduction programmes, and again that can be done through local charities, energy advice centres, and the support we can offer. Once you've dropped the demand, look what renewable resources you have, and I would definitely look at everything. Even if you have to explain to people why you're not putting a wind turbine up, you're not doing hydro. We want to engage people, we want them to understand, understand all the options, we try and target every resource we can across the area. Then we're on to the legal structures. Again, there's people around that will help with all these things, that will help put the support forward. And um, Co-op Enterprise Hub is still running, so there's a bit of money to support you doing that at the moment. Um, generally, we consult after we have projects in place. Um, but some of the groups are working with run consultations early on. Uh, to try and build up the numbers and numbers in the group. Very simple to get started. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs>